Oh, you hug? Want you to hug? I hug. We all get over it. Oh, I love you. I love you, too. Oh, my goodness. to sign for three of our missionaries and missionary kids on the back table. I had forgotten to announce that a few weeks, and uh, Dave works very hard to have those there, and Bethany Bailey works very hard to have those cards prepared. So if you would, flood that thing with signatures. Um, let me pray. Father God, thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you so much for your sustaining power. God, that you enable us to be steadfast in our walk. Lord, in those times of <clears throat> fear, or Lord, just times where we feel dry, you so kindly and so lovingly come to us and refresh us. So, Father, I praise your name for that truth, and I thank you. I ask for your blessing on PCBC today, Lord, as we've gathered. We want to sing, worship, honor, and glory to you, Father. And I pray that your blessing would be on the preaching of the word, and that we would be a people that love the gospel even more, because we came today. For the glory and honor of our precious Savior, Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Very good. <laughs> Who wasn't here last Sunday? Who wasn't? How many were able, even though you weren't here, to watch the cast? Was your faith strengthened by Mitch and Mary Ellen's testimony? Was it? Was your faith strengthened? There were some incredible moments in their testimony. There were some chuckles, like that crazy Randy guy. <laughs> and there were some Kleenex moments as well. If you would, would you turn to Hebrews 6? <coughs> writer in chapter 6 is talking about some things that really are difficult to understand in some respects. But you get to verse 11, and the writer is saying, our great desire that, is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and obedience. For example, there was God's promise to Abraham. Since there was no one greater to swear by, God took an oath in his own name, saying, I will certainly bless you, and I will multiply your descendants beyond number. Then Abraham waited patiently, and he received what God had promised. Now, when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without any question, that oath is binding. God also bound himself with an oath so that, there, that those who believe, who received the promise, could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Is your faith really that strong an anchor? What if Mitch and Mary Ellen's testimony had been that the fire didn't stop right here? What if it had gone all the way? Do you think they still could have stood up here and praised God the way they did last Sunday for saving them? I want to believe they could. But we all have to come to the point, are we willing to trust these promises God has given us? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Are we willing to go so deep into looking at our faith to see whether or not it is that trustworthy anchor? And can we praise him and give him the glory, whether the diagnosis from the doctor is good or bad? Can we give God the glory in that moment? I pray that it is. I pray that's true for every one of us. And for those of us that are still struggling with that anchor, whether or not it's as strong as we want it to be, <coughs> I pray that the Word of God will find its place in your heart to strengthen that anchor 
so that God gets the glory, whatever the outcome. Father, we desperately need your help. We are weak vessels. We get bumped. Things spill out. And I pray, Father, that you would run with your word to our hearts. God, that you would strengthen our inner being. And God, that we would grab hold of that anchor and trust it to the end of time. In Jesus' name. Please stand. Let's sing one day. <laughs>
Good morning. Good morning. Let's bring that down. Just a little bit. There we go. I might just whisper to you this morning. Um, so if you would turn with me to Genesis chapter 10. I can bring down a little bit more. Genesis chapter 10 is where we're going to turn to. Um, before we go there, um, I actually had the privilege, I see it as that, um, I got to watch Mitch and Mary Ellen lose their house um, because they were utterly convinced that they had lost it uh, when I spoke to them. And I, the answer to the question, Raj, is yeah, they were just as strong, saddened by all means. But I remember talking to Mitch and Mary Ellen <coughs> and seeing that God was sustaining them in the midst of tears and 
as being so distraught. And so my faith was built up by what they shared last week, but it was even more built up by that time where they thought they had lost their home and the Lord sustained them powerfully. Let me pray before we turn to the Word. Father, I ask that, Lord, you would, you would shine through your Word and that, Father God, um, I would fade. That this is not about any man or any particular church, but this is about the precious truth of the Word of God and the glory and honor of His name. And so, Father, may your Word uh, speak today. God, I don't know everything going on in all the lives that are seated in this place right now. I don't know how this text is going to land on them. But I totally trust you, Father, to do what you wish and or will to do with your word in the lives of your people in this place. So, my Father, I just freshly trust you and recognize your sovereignty in the application of your word. And speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so my beloved church family, one of my favorite parts of you as a church is your love for the Word and your patience with me. I'm going to read chapter 10, and this is the proper pronunciation of every name. <laughs> and if you say it differently from here on forth, I don't care. So chapter 10, verse 1. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, are you thinking of Andy Griffith right now? <laughs> Magog, Medei, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Targamoth, yeah, yeah, uh, the sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Kim, and Dodanim. These are the coastland people spread in their lands, each with his own language, by their clans in their nations. <clears throat> the sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Sheba, Havilah, Sabta, Rayama, and Sabtica. You know, it's funny if you think about it. If people were walking by the window, they're thinking we're, I'm speaking in tongues from the pulpit. <laughs> the sons of Rayama, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Eric, Akid, and Kalmai in the land of Shinar. From that, that land, he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, uh, Ur, Kela, resin between Nineveh and Kela, that is the great city. Egypt fathered Ludim, Anamim, Lahabim, Naphtahim, uh, Pathrazim, Caslahim, from whom the Philistines came, and Kaphtarim. Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvidites, the Zemorites, and the Hamathorites. Afterward, the clans of the Canaanites dispersed, and the territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar as far as Gaza, and in the direction of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim, as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham, by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. To Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth, uh, children were born. The sons of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arpashad, Lud, or Lud, however you want to say that, and Aram. The sons of Aram, Uz, Hol, Gether, and Mash. Arpashad fathered Shelah, and Shelah fathered Eber. 
To Eber were born two sons, the name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan fathered Almadad, Sheleph, Hazramath, Jerah, Hadaram, Uzal, Diklah, Obol, Ib, Mael, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan. The territory in which they lived extended from Mesha in the direction of Sefer to the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem, by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. These are the clans of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies in their nations, and from these the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. <laughs> you know, when... <clears throat> When Amber and I were picking out names for our kids, we never once went to Genesis. <laughs> okay. Now, I've been a Christian most of my life. I've been in church all of my life. And we all know that when we come to a genealogy, usually folks sigh and it's a, it's a little bit more sticky to teach or to study or so on and so forth. But if I can sober us up just a little bit um, there is a great need for a genealogy in the scripture. Uh, remember, beloved, the word of God is not, it's not a plaything. It's, it's not a storybook. These are not fairy tales. These are not names that a, a, a writer came up with to fill his story. These are individuals alive at that time in the purpose and in the will of God to accomplish his great end. Now, I want to remind you of the context where we're at presently. And the reason a genealogy is so important here is because this kicks off uh, telling us what's going to be taking place after the flood. So Noah and his three sons, uh, now they are going to fulfill what God commanded them. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, right? We heard that. You know, the same thing that was said to Adam, now it's been said to Noah. And here's Noah's sons doing exactly that. This is a, a big um, shotgunning, if you will, of what's going to take place in the dispersion of all these peoples. And so here is a massive list of names and of nations that will be spreading throughout from here. And we will be hearing throughout the book of Genesis, specifically about those who came from Shem, namely Abraham. But throughout the rest of your Old Testament, you will continually come across the nations that came from these groups. You'll read all about the Canaanites, all these ites that I just read for you. You'll be hearing about them throughout the story of the Old Testament. And so <clears throat> it's kind of like the foundation may not be the easiest piece, but once the foundation is set, now you have something to build upon. And so I just challenge you, don't let a genealogy pass too quickly. Don't waste a genealogy in your Bible. I, I have friends that they, when they read through their Bible annually, they don't read that. They just skip it all together. Why? Well, it's hard to pronounce, and you're wondering, is this a place or is this a person? What, what am I looking at here? It's worth the attention. The Lord doesn't waste ink in his word. And so what do we have here? I'm going to go through chapter 10 in a matter of minutes and then take you to chapter 11, but... You can't really get to chapter 10 without chapter 11. And if I skipped it, I'd hear about it in emails for the next month. So, Japheth. Japheth and his descendants settled Europe and the greater part of Asia Minor. I don't have a map for you this morning. I'm not, I'm not Dennis Chris enough to do that. So, uh, <clears throat> but if you need a map or a chart for anything on the planet, one of our elders will see you right out. Ham uh, settled more, his people settled more North Africa and the uh, Eastern Mediterranean coastlands. And I, I did look at this on the map and kind of see where these peoples went by the description here in chapter 10. But for my purpose this morning, that's not the main objective here. Shem, his people settled Mesopotamia and Arabia. And maybe in your study Bible, you have either a map in the back or the study Bible I was using this week. Uh, actually had a map right there in the text right below here and showed me where everything was settled. And I thought, okay, that, great. Gives me a nice visual of where all these people are settling. All peoples came from Noah's sons, which came from Noah, which ultimately came from Adam and Eve. But you had this tremendous flood and now a repopulation of the earth. Notice clans, languages, lands, and nations. 
This is important because in chapter 11, let me touch us on this right now. Chapter 11, it begins by saying they were all speaking one language. And um, as you look at that, you go, no, wait a minute. It says they're all in their clans and languages, plural. And then you come to chapter 11 and you say, well, it just says language. They all have their same language. How does this work? Well, the answer is that this is not chronological. Chapter 10 and chapter 11 are not chronological. Chapter 10 is telling us what's be going to be taking place throughout the rest of the unfolding of, this groups of, of these groups of people. So it's not that, oh, they all have their own languages, then they come down to one language in chapter 11. No, chapter 10 is giving us a great um, panoramic view, a great big exploded view of what's going to take place when all the nations are dispersed. That's kind of how genealogies work. When he tells us the genealogy, he's telling us as far as it's going to be going. So chapter 10 is not necessarily in a chronological order of chapter 11. Chapter 11 is going to be a story all of its, all of its own in the midst of the genealogies because the rest of chapter 11 is the rest of the genealogy. That being said, so clans, languages, lands, and nations... Here is where I think we must get a grasp where we will miss so much of our Bible. Redemptive history will unfold as God selects Israel, specifically as he comes to Abraham, who we'll see in chapter 12, and selects Israel to be a lighthouse to the nations. And he'll seek to use them as a light to the nations. It will be a Jewish Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, that will come from this particular people. Now, the interesting part, and the reason that's important, is that we see the, the spreading out of the nations. God specifically seeks out Abraham. We'll touch on this a lot in the weeks to come. I want to remind you what the book of Deuteronomy tells us, I believe in chapter 7, that God's selection of Abraham and his selection of Israel has nothing to do with the grandeur and glory of Abraham or of Israel. It has everything to do with God's selective purpose. That's not me saying that. That's the text saying that. The Lord did not say, well, I came and chose Israel because they were the biggest. They weren't. Because they were the greatest. They weren't. No, rather, God has a redemptive plan to come to Abraham, and then through Abraham's seed, we're going to hear a lot about that, he will bless people from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. So the reason this is so important to me personally is because this is a piece I missed as a Bible student, as a kid, because I did not see what is the connection of my Old Testament and New Testament and how do all these pieces come together in unity. Well, they come together in unity because you see the dispersion of all the nations here. God's about to select Abraham, but through the seed of Abraham, God's going to bless every nation. Now, not every single person but people from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. And so having, having a proper foundation in reference to the dispersion that takes place here and God's full game plan through redemptive history, the pivot point you have to have clear theologically between your ears is that this is all on purpose. It is a... I want to choose my word careful. It's a, a task that, it's a fool's errand. To read the Bible as if it is consistently God responding, not knowing what's next. Because the more you read the scripture, the more you see the sovereign game plan throughout redemptive history, that Almighty God is actually doing all this on purpose. He's not messing up and trying to fix things. He's in charge, sovereignly in charge, and redemptive history has a perfect plan that is completely unfolding. So here in chapter 10, you have 70 nations, 14 from Japheth, 30 from Ham, and 26 from Shem. And we're told that Nimrod is the mighty warrior who was in charge of building Babel. Well, now if you would, turn with me to chapter 11. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. The literal is they had one lip. And as people were migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. 
And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Now, I don't know about you, but the text that immediately rushed to my mind was in the book of James, where James says, Come ye, come ye you who say, uh, Today we will go here, and we will build here, and make a profit, such and such. And the Lord's rebuke of them in that passage is, You fool, you do not know what one day will hold. I'll go to that text, but... But that, that concept is a concept that you will find threaded throughout your Bible. And it's the, it's the hub of this passage. Is a godless planet, a godless life, a godless um, design, and a godless ambition. And so now that we've seen kind of the backdrop of what we're going to see in the dispersion the Lord shows us what's taking place in the heart of men. Remember, we're, we're somewhat fresh out of the flood, and now this is taking place. So if you would, look down at verse 1 of chapter 11. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. So here is a group of people that are moving towards, they're moving together towards this beautiful plain there in Shinar with a desire to build a city. And the interesting part is, as you first lay your eyes on the passage, your, your first thought is, what's wrong with that? What's the problem with that? Um, can Christians be involved in city development? Of course they can. Isn't that wrong with that? Can Christians have a desire, people who want to be obedient to God, can they have a desire to see a structure built? Of course they can. See, this is the interesting piece of the Tower of Babel, is that when we read what they wanted to do, none of us have a problem with that. No issue. But like everything else on this planet, the problem, if you will, the, the issue is the motive behind the doing. How many times does the Lord touch on the motives, specifically the Lord Jesus throughout the Gospels, touch on the motives of the actions being performed? Well, it's no different here. And let me remind you that this is still a sinful people. This is still a people that are sinful from birth, born in sin, with a desire for a godless life. And here's the tough part, you guys, is that there's this vacuum being filled constantly that is God's, but not being filled with God. And so here are the group of, of people moving to the east with a desire to build a city, and the great glory of that city will be all about them. So the plan, what's the plan? We're going to build a city, we're going to build a tower. What's the materials? What are they going to use? We're going to take this mud brick, we're going to make it, make it super strong, and put bitumen in there for mortar, and we're going to build up this city. And it'll look beautiful. Um, I went to uh, Boston, Massachusetts a lot of years ago, and I remember walking through there and just seeing some of these super high towers in the city. When my kids and I drive to Portland, uh, which is not very regular. When we go over there, they always love seeing the huge skyscrapers and all the bridges and all of the, the ability of what man, what man has shown himself to have in all of that structure. And it is breathtaking. So let me, let me take a step back here and just think about all the things you and I have seen human beings do in this life. It's astounding to think of what they do in the medical field. Uh, I have a heart murmur, and I, each year when I get another checkup on how things are going, they inform me of how much better it's going to be when that valve has to be replaced. <laughs> when I'm 89. <clears throat> when you see the structures 
when you see the incredible design, I, I don't have my phone on me, but when you, when you look at the little smartphone, you think of all the capabilities there. You think of the communication capabilities. You think of all the technology, the structure, the, the strength, the power. All of that is absolutely phenomenal when you look at what human beings are doing. Well, this is why I don't want to detach this from the text, because the text is simply saying, look at what these guys are building. This is fantastic. And you can imagine the, the excitement in the air among everybody. All of the, the hopes and dreams. Let's all get together. And here's the materials we'll use, and here's what we're going to do as far as our design for the city. And then we're going to build this massive tower that goes up to the heavens. It's going to be glorious. My grandkids will glory in me. My great-grandkids will glory in me. This is going to be phenomenal. Look, look down at the text, if you would. Chapter 10 says, uh, verse 4, Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. It's one thing when we can kind of be wowed at the ingenuity of, of people. I'm, I like, I love, there's a little show called How It's Made. It's one of my favorite shows. I love to watch how things are made. It's just like, wow, that's what smart people do when I was watching MacGyver. Now I, now I get this. <laughs> but seeing the ingenuity of the design fascinates me. But beloved, the problem here is do you see... There is no God. This is an atheistic game plan. We want to come and we want to build a massive city and we want to make a great name for us. I want that. I've heard stories about people who want to donate millions of dollars to a particular school, but their desire is to see their name on that school. I want a name for myself. See, it's interesting. You, if you were to stop and ask the question, so then what's the, what's the fear of this group of people? Well, the text tells us they don't want to be dispersed all over the place. And if they want a name, that indicates the last thing they want is to be forgotten. I want to go down in history being known. This is the glory battle that all of us are in with the Lord God. So, let me pick up where I just left off reading. Verse 5, we're going to look at a divine response. The divine response here from the Lord. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people. And they have all one language, and this is, the, this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Really quick, just side note here. That phrase is an interesting one, the Lord came down, right? Because we believe in the omnipresence of God. All you got to do is read through your, just the Psalms alone, but read through your Old Testament, you'll see... The omnipresence of God is a um, just accepted norm throughout the scripture. So when it says the Lord came down, it's not a matter of him going, I wonder what they're doing down there. He's, uh, he's fully omniscient of all things, and he's completely omnipresent. So it's not a matter of God being unaware of their actions. What it is showing us is that there is a particular attention the Lord is showing the actions of men here specifically. Now, why is it important? It's important because it completely shuts down the deists. That concept that God wound the clock and then just let it go and he has no dealings with his people. That's, that's, um, that's not true in any way, shape, or form. Study the scriptures. The living God is involved and in the midst of the lives of his people. Just as much here as he is today in you. God is not up, up in heaven, wringing his hands, looking at America, freaked out about riots. He's 
sovereignly in control over all things, working to an ultimate end. If he was sovereignly in control, working all things to a perfect end at the moment of the crucifixion of Jesus, he is today just as much. So when it says he came down, it's, uh, again, there's that 50 cent word, it's anthropomorphic language. The concept that it takes a, an action of creatures and uses it in reference to God to communicate a fact. And that fact simply being the Lord came and recognized and is giving attention to the actions of these people. By the way, side note, isn't it interesting that the Lord doesn't always choose to do this? I mean, throughout church history, the Lord did not intervene when things were really bad. Right now, there would be some people saying, the Lord's not intervening. I sat there with Christians who, looking to the sky, screaming in prayer, saying, he never answers me. Well, he does, but he's intervening on his terms, and that's what we submit to. But here, particularly, the Lord specifically acts in reference to this group of people. Listen to what he does. He says, come, let us go down and there confuse their languages so that they may not understand one another's speech. Now, there's a very important word. Did you catch it in the text? Us. Man, I love you guys. Us. I, I tell you, it is amazing the more that true historical doctrine of the Trinity falls out of the text. And you go, I didn't even know it was there. Come, let us make man in our image. Come, let us go and do what he's about to do here. All throughout the scripture, the Lord Jesus Christ is seen as full deity, fully God. The Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 5 is referred to as God. And God the Father is referred to as God throughout the whole scriptures. That doctrine of the Trinity is precious, worth dying for, and clearly shown in the word of God. So let us go down and confuse their languages. Now this is where Dan has a really hard... I have struggled with this kind of stuff, you guys, because it's the white space again where I am very interested, how did he confuse their languages? Not only that, but it says he confused their languages, and then he dispersed them all abroad. So was it like a, was it a, was it a zap? And there were different languages? Did this take time? I mean, it doesn't necessarily say that this happened in that moment, per se. I don't know the answer to the question, but... <coughs> I do know what took place. It's how it took place that I'm always interested in. How did the Lord accomplish this task to disperse everyone with different languages so that way they are confused? Now, really, really fast, I want to say this because I don't want to miss this point. This is not the Lord responding in fear. There, there are sometimes where, where folks will preach this text or commentators and they may give a little bit of a flavor where God is like, oh, what am I going to do? They're down there doing that. I've got to go change things and fix things. Let me give you just a little paradigm shift. I, I think that this act of the Tower of Babel is gracious. Beloved, what, how do you feel when you meet somebody that is completely godless? And don't answer the question, just... Ponder with me. How do you respond when you meet somebody that completely is godless? Their whole life is for themselves. They are completely wrapped up in them and their name and their greatness with no thought to their creator. The, the longer I'm a believer, the more I feel sad and pity with that being their life. And so I don't see this as the Lord's scared of what they're going to do. Rather, I see this as the Lord's grace to remind them of their incredible fragility and need. This is the 
tricky part of us as people is I can feel like the strongest man in the world in an instant and then I throw my back out and I'm crawling with tears asking that cup of coffee be brought to the chair and the Lord says you forgot you forgot your dependency you've ignored your dependency on me Dan you, you, you missed it <clears throat> And so by grace, follow my And so when I read the Tower of Babel, I don't see this as God being scared and having to rush to the occasion to, oh, what am I going to do? I'm in competition with these people. Come on, that is not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is the sovereign king of the universe who laughs, we're told in Psalms 2. When everybody's up against him and trying to take him down, it says, he who is in the heavens laughs. You didn't throw him off his game one bit with the building of this tower. But God in his grace is going to disperse the nations. Give them different languages so that way there is confusion. That that way they cannot do even more harm onto themselves. Let me just remind you guys of this fact. I know, I probably don't have to, but I have to remind myself this often. God's laws, God's rules, and God's actions flow out of love for us. Now, my heart, when I see that speed limit sign, I think, how much faster can I go? <laughs> because I have a rebellious, sinful heart. So when I read God's laws, I go, oh, he's, he's, he's doing it again. He's trying to condemn us. No, beloved, he's doing it because he loves you. A father does not lay down rules because he hates his kids. He lays down the rules because he loves his kids. And so is this an act of God getting retribution on these rebellious people? I don't think so. I think that's playing it too cheap to simply say that that's the issue here. Rather, I see a divine, gracious act for these people. And so, look at the verse 9. It says, Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the languages of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of the, all the earth. So, as God did this, the city was called Babel. This was like um, linked to the verb Balal, means to confuse or to scramble, which is ironic. Think about this, you guys. It's so ironic. This whole thing kicked off with a passion for their own glory. And it ended with them looking like fools. How so? Well, let me just say, when Raja and I go down, when we've gone down to Africa, I have learned <clears throat> speaking English louder does not translate <laughs> well. <laughs> I said, Dan, Dan. Still doesn't work. And so could you imagine the confusion of different languages and different tongues as those people were speaking to one another, incapable of confusing? I never feel more stupid. Well, that's not true. <laughs> I feel very, very silly when talking with somebody who doesn't know English and I don't know their language and you're trying to communicate and all of a sudden my hands come up and I don't know sign language. When I start doing stuff, it's like, this is ridiculous. So let me find somebody to interpret for me. This whole thing started with, let's make a great name for ourselves. You sure made a name for yourself, but it's not for your glory. And for the rest of history, the people of God will be reading about the confusion and the disbursement of the Tower of Babel. He who thinks he stand, take heed lest he fall. Pride comes before a fall. God will not share his glory with another. And they wanted it bad. And he did not allow that. So let me end on this note of application. I, I realize, guys, that when, you, when we come together and I open the word and we talk about the word of God and hear the preaching of the word, you wouldn't believe how many different pieces of application pop up in the study of the text. You probably, maybe you would believe. 
And the passage is going to land on all of you a little different because of all the stuff you've gone through in your life and all the stuff you went through this week and perhaps this morning. But this is what funneled down in my mind. So let me just say, when I bring an application from a text, I am not saying this is the only application. I'm saying this is the one that I kind of funneled down to. And here's my question. If this is true, and I believe it is with all my heart, if this is true, and every single one of us, every tongue tribe, people, nation, all came from Adam, which then went to Noah, and Noah's three sons, and then this massive dispersion. My question is, what truly, and that's my key word, what truly divides the human race? I know it's a hot topic, and lots of people like to bicker about it right now. I get all that. I don't really care about that. Let me push that off the table. The question that would be asked is race, gender, political perspectives, your profession, your social status, bank account, your pay grade, the denomination your great aunt was at, your nationality. Are those what divide us? Are those what make us to differ? See, this is what is so interesting in my mind as I hear some of the ranting and raving and fighting in our world right now is as a believer, as a Christian, I boil all that down and I ask the word of God, Father, what divides us? Jesus. And I don't mean us. I mean the human race. What divides us, beloved? Jesus. I have clung tightly to a brother who does not speak my language. His skin color is a lot darker than mine. He lives in extreme poverty. And his heart is bursting with joy for the same Savior that has rescued me from the pit of hell. And I realize that there are some differences in our world. But I want to come to you this morning and say, beloved, as a Christian, make sure you're looking at the correct dividing line. Because the true dividing line of the human race is Jesus. Those who are in Christ are saints. I don't mean that in the silly, you know, well, make me a saint. I mean the saints in the sense of truly born again, new person in Christ. Those who are in Christ are the sons of God, daughters of God. Those who are in Christ are righteous in Christ. Those who are in Christ hold the word of God and have the spirit of God to understand the word of God. Those who are in Christ have the glory of heaven awaiting them. Those who are in Christ have the fullness of joy inexpressible for all eternity. We have that in common with one another. And it breaks the barrier of anything this life can put up against it. And those who are not in Christ are forever tormented in hell under the wrath of God. Beloved, there is nothing that divides us like that. And so as you see the dispersion of the nations, as they start their own different cultures, as they have their own languages, as they, they have their own skin tone, as they have all these different things, and you read through the rest of your Bible, the Lord Jesus comes on the stage and he doesn't say, who's better and who's worse? He comes and he stands and he says, do not think I've come to bring peace. I've come to bring a sword that will divide. Those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. So two things that I want to pray. Love fiercely those in Jesus. Love fiercely those in Jesus. 
I always have this picture in my mind when we start talking about fights and divisions Christians have. I picture two believers discussing a very minor point of doctrine or the color of the carpet, bickering back and forth as they walk side by side into the arena to be fed to the lions for the sake of Christ. Let's remember the main thing, beloved. Love fiercely those who are in Christ. And number two, preach, pray, and pursue those who are outside of Christ. This is a Christian worldview. It's at odds with our world right now. There are so many people trying to divide us over social issues that completely replace the truth of the gospel. I beg of you, don't, don't fall for that. That true dividing line is the cross of Jesus Christ. You are on mission in this life. So love one another fiercely and pursue with all the passion you've got this lost world. Our Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the work, the person of the Lord Jesus, Almighty God, Creator, in the flesh, being crucified that he might redeem a people special unto himself from every tongue and tribe and people and nation for all eternity. My Father, I ask of you this morning that you would grant us gospel lenses as we watch this world tear itself apart we would be faithful to point them to the Redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Please stand.
Father, we are blessed beyond measure when we stop and let ourselves rest in the thought that this world is absolutely, totally in your control. Amen. And everything we see around us, everything we read about from ancient times has been at your hand. And God, I pray, as Dan encouraged us just now, that we would love fiercely the brothers and sisters in faith. And God, that we would preach, pray, and proclaim the name of Jesus to those outside the faith. So Father, I ask that you give everyone in this room this next week that opportunity to preach, to pray, and to proclaim. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.